Welcome to this online lesson on cowboys, cattle and beefy profits. How did the cattle industry develop? Now don't worry, I am told that this lesson is suitable for vegans. Let me first of all introduce you to one of my friends. This is a Texas longhorn cow. It can survive in dry conditions. It has long horns and it lives in Texas. And it says Mur! quite a lot. So what might make this cow worth more in one place than it is in another? Pause the video now and have a go at that. So, okay, what might make that cow worth more in one place than it is in another? Well, let's imagine you've got loads of cattle, but you don't need any of them. You're probably not going to pay very much for any more cows, are you? In fact, you probably won't pay anything at all. Now, in Texas, where this Texas longhorn cow, cow was, uh, de was developed and bred, um, there were lots and lots of cattle, and so cows did not fetch a very high price in Texas. However, you move up to the northern and eastern cities, places like Chicago, and there are very few cattle there, on account of them being, you know, cities. So, cattle there were very valuable, and yet there were loads of people who wanted to buy cattle for their beef and feed all those hungry people within the cities. So a cow in Texas where there are loads of cattle and not much demand for, fur for food would not be worth very much, but a cow in Chicago where there were loads of hungry mouths to feed would be worth an awful lot. And that essentially is the economics of the cattle industry in the American West. So let's have a look at some other details. The need for beef. Before the American Civil War, cattle in Texas had been driven by cowboys across the south to be sold. Effectively, they were being driven east-west. The Civil War meant that cowboys left to fight. In the meantime, the unsupervised cattle did what cattle do very well. Um, how do I put this delicately? When a mummy cow and a daddy cow love each other very, very much, they have lots of little baby cowlets, or calves, as I should call them. By 1866, the surviving cowboys came back to enormous herds that had multiplied unsupervised and during all that time. There were so many that they could only be sold for $5 a piece in Texas. Meanwhile, a cow in Chicago was fetching $40. There was one small problem. How on earth do you get a cow up to Chicago? So your task is this. Explain why the Civil War led to an increase in the number of cows in Texas, without getting too graphic. And then secondly, explain why the cattle were worth such a low price in Texas compared to the North. Pause the video while you complete those tasks. Okay. Remember that the Civil War led to an increase in cattle because the cattle were unsupervised as the cowboys were away fighting in the war. And they were worth such a low price in Texas because there were so many there and nobody wanted them. Whereas in the North, in places like Chicago, they were worth a lot more because there were lots of hungry people to feed. Here you're going to do a research and summarization task. On pages one to three of the BBC Bite Size page that you can find in the links, you will find most of the information that you need on the individuals and groups who contributed to the rise of the cattle industry. We're going to focus on three in particular. Goodnight and Loving, so this is Charles Goodnight and Oliver Loving, Joseph McCoy and John Eiliff. You might want to take, take some notes on others, others too, that's up to you. You need to read the information. You'll find most of this, like I say, on pages one to three. And then note down the following. Their name, what they did, what did they develop. For example, it might be a cow town or it might be a new route. And how did the government help them if they helped them at all? If you can't find the information for that last one, don't hang about, just move on. Okay, there will be more cow puns. Just prepare yourselves. Decide who is most important in the development of the cattle industry. List their names from, from one to three in order of importance. And then explain your choice of the most important example. Use point example explain for this. And finally, as a challenge, what risks might there be to the long-term profitability of the cattle industry? Are there any risks? Okay, so pause the video now and you'll want to complete that task. I reckon 45 minutes should be enough time. That seemed to go quickly. Yeah, it did for me anyway. So, that last challenge activity, hopefully you've been able to answer everything else so far, but did you identify any, lo identify any long term risks? Well, what about if the cattle price simply crashes? Maybe there's a uh, dying off of the cattle or the, um, or the numbers or the, uh, uh, the quality of the beef uh, decreases, all of that would affect the cattle industry. And also, if there get to be too many big players in the cattle industry, you've got a risk of swamping the market, meaning that those cattle will fetch a lower price overall. We're going to do a quick cattle quiz now to see if you've got the relevant knowledge from that task. 
If you haven't, here's an opportunity to catch up. What was the name of the cow town founded by Joseph McCoy? What was established by Goodnight and Loving? Why did the American Civil War result in Texas cattle overbreeding? If a cow was worth $5 in Texas, how much is it worth in Chicago? John Iliff established the first farm purely for cattle. What name is given to such farms? What breed of cow is shown in the top right picture? What do you call it when cowboys herd cattle across large distances? What type of rail carriage was used to transport the moo cows? And the in environment in which cattle were free to roam without being fenced in was called the open what? Lastly, rich businessmen who had a lot of influence in the 1870s beef bonanza were known as cattle what? Pause the video now while you answer those questions and then we'll have a look at what the answers are. So don't cheat. Okay, pause now. Ready? Okay, let's check. Joseph McCoy established Abilene. This was the first cow town. This is where cattle could be driven to and then they would be loaded onto boxcars, which is a later answer as well, and sold in the cities. Goodnight and Loving established the Goodnight Loving Trail. This was a trail up to the Indian reservations where the cattle could be sold to the government at a high price to feed the Indians. Why did the American Civil War result in Texas cattle overbreeding? Because the cowboys left for the war and the cattle were unsupervised. A cow is worth $40 in Chicago compared to the $5 it was worth in, in Texas. John Eilish, uh, Eilish, Eilish? No. John Eilish established the first farm purely for cattle. The name that was given to such farms were ranches, so he established a ranch. The breed of cow that is shown in the picture is the Texas Longhorn. What do you call it when cowboys herd cattle across large dif distances? Well, they call them cattle drives. The type of rail carriage is a boxcar and the environment in which the cattle are free to roam about is known as the open range. Lastly, the cattle barons were the ones who made the money from the beef bonanza. Correct any wrong answers that you got and if you want to have another go at that quiz from, from, uh, from memory then just go back and do it. All right, we're going to have a look at the reasons for the growth of the cattle industry now. What you're going to do is you're going to use this diagram to explain how key individuals were able to develop ways to meet new but demands for beef from different markets after the Civil War. Explain how cow towns are linked to the challenges of uh, challenges, transportation, markets and key individuals. And then draw as many links as you can between the railroads and the rest of the diagram. As a challenge, can you explain the links? Now it is worth drawing out your own version of this diagram which will make the tasks, tasks easier and it's a handy revision technique too. Firstly we've got the developments, things like the cattle trails like that one there developed by Goodnight and Loving, the cow town, towns like Abilene developed by Joseph McCoy, ranching like John Iliff and the open range. There were challenges like the Civil War, the Plains Indians attacking them, rustling which means the stealing of cattle, long distances to cover on the, on the long drive, farmers and settlers getting in the way and Texas fever and other diseases that harm the cattle. There's also the issue of transportation. Railroads made transportation much easier from the late 1860s onwards. Also there were rail towns, long drives and cowboys all as ways as of moving the cattle. Then there were the markets. By markets I mean the places or groups that the cattle were sold to. Miners needed feeding, so we're talking things like the gold miners, Indian reservations, industrial cities in the east and the north, meat packing facilities which allowed uh, later on for meat to be preserved, and the railroad builders who also needed feeding. And then lastly there were the key individuals, some of which we've already had a look at. Goodnight and Loving, Eilif, McCoy and the Cattle Barons. Alright, pause the video here and you'll probably want to spend about half an hour on that task. Okay, we're going to move on. One of the key features of this period is the conflict and tension that there was between the ranchers and the homesteaders. So as a bit of a recap, what was the Homestead Act of 1862? How much land would it grant? And what were the conditions of keeping that land? Well, if you've not done that lesson, there is a uh, homesteading lesson that is previous to this one in the playlist. However, the Homestead Act of 1862 granted 160 acres of land for a $10 registration fee. The only other condition was that you had to farm it for five years in order to keep that land for free. 
Um, the problem with that is it wasn't diff it wasn't uh, difficult to get the land, but it was very difficult to make it into a successful farm. And so the homesteaders always had their backs up against the wall in terms of ha having enough money in order to survive. What didn't make that um, easier was the fact that the ranchers absolutely despised them because they got onto the open range and, in their view, spoilt the so-called open and public land that their cattle were was grazing on. So ranchers often come into conflict with the homesteaders on the plains for the following reasons. Firstly, the ranchers. Ranching required huge amounts of public grazing land, around 2,000 acres or more. Ranchers used legal and illegal tactics to block homesteaders from claiming public grazing land on their ran and that their ranching relied on. On the other hand, the homesteaders, they were claiming land under the Homestead Act and turned li little pockets of public land into private farms. These might be surrounded by barbed wire later on. Ranchers accused them of rustling, which meant stealing their free roaming cattle. They also complained that the homesteaders' barbed wire fences harmed their cattle, which could be true. So, note down a summary of the information about the ranchers and the homesteaders. Then, once you've done that, take a note of these questions. Read the cards, sort them into the following categories, legal tactics and illegal tactics. So if you note down those headings now, the cards will be appearing on the next screen. And then, are there are any of the legal tactics also immoral? That means that they're kind of morally wrong, they're not the right thing to do. So make sure you complete task one, and then that you record legal tactics and illegal tactics with plenty of space underneath so you can make some notes based upon the cards that will appear on the next screen. Pause the video now while you do that. Okay, hopefully you've got task one done and that you've got those uh, those headings down as well because this screen is disappearing and the cards are about to appear. And here are those cards. Okay, I am gonna read these to you, but you don't have to listen to me drone on about that unless you, you don't want to. So you could pause the video now and save yourself the bother. If not, I might well explain some of them in a bit more detail. So if you're, you're struggling a bit, stay tuned and then you can pause it at the end. So, number one, ranchers would make Homestead Act claims on bits of land with watering holes. This made the rest of the surrounding land unattractive to homesteaders. Okay, watering holes are quite um, few and far between, and so if you didn't get access to one, it was very difficult to set up your homestead. Secondly, ranch hands and uh, family members of ranch owners made Homestead Act claims themselves and then handed the land back to the ranch. This was not exactly uh, the right way of doing things. It was difficult for the government to find out if they were doing it because they had no real system for checking it, but it's not particularly fair to the genuine homesteaders. Thirdly, rich ranchers brought, bought patches of land from the railroad companies where the railroads crossed the land. This was done in patches like a chessboard, like a checkerboard, where there would be one claim and then nothing, another claim and then nothing. This meant that there were patches of public land that couldn't be used by the homesteaders anyway, and so they got double their money, or double the land for their money rather. Rich farm owners um, who knew that they were acting illegally took homesteaders to court. The homesteaders didn't have the money to back up their claim in the courts, and so the rich farm owners typically won. Legal, but hardly fair. Five, ranchers threatened homesteaders with violence so the homesteaders would give up before they had finished their five years of farming. This might be done with so-called hired guns who would go around there and threaten them. Six, ranchers would damage homesteads instead of crops so that their farms would fail. It might be something as simple as cutting the fence down and then letting the cows roam in. Seven, ranchers accused homesteaders of rustling. These claims are often false, but homesteaders were too poor to prove this in court. That's closely linked with um, fact number four. Fact number eight, homesteaders convicted uh, of cattle rustling faced very heavy punishments in cattle states that relied on the ranches to make money. Uh, because the states were able to set the, their own laws to a certain extent, it meant that the penalties could be set very high by the ruling class, which in these places were people like the cattle barons. And number nine, ranchers vandalised the cut bar and cut barbed wire fences. This would cause cattle to wander on the homesteads and ruin the crops. Ranchers might even accuse the homesteaders of rustling their cows. Again, this is linked to this idea of the false claims and um, event number six with the damage to homesteaders crops. That's enough yakking from me for now, so pause the video and complete the tasks that we mentioned on the previous screen. Pause now. So, we're going to conclude with some exam style questions. I'm not going to go through uh, the detailed ways of answering these or any example answers, but you can have a go nonetheless if you need the practice. 
So describe two features of cattle drives in the 1860s and 1870s. All you need to do for that is just give two examples and explain what they meant. Then describe two features of conflict between the homesteaders and the ranchers. Just use the same process. Remember, four mark questions will not appear in paper two in this form. However, it's useful to practice them in terms of writing that sort of format question, and it's a good check of your knowledge. Thirdly, explain any two of the following. Now, these are in the sort of um, uh, format that you might expect in the exam. Explain why the ranchers came into conflict with the homesteaders. Explain why the cattle industry grew in the 1860s and 1870s. And explain why the buffalo were important to the Plains Indians' lifestyle. That last one is more for your revision purposes than just to consolidate your knowledge on the cattle industry. For these, you'll need to include around two different examples explained in detail. So two peel answers per question, point, example, explain and link. And you might want to include a brief conclusion as well. And on that note, the lesson is at a conclusion. So you can pause the video if you want to have a go at those exam style answers. If not, I'll say thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Um, in the meantime, if you did find that useful, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Goodbye.